And welcome back to the Dino Bidala Show. Third f- hour on Friday can only mean one thing. What just happened? As we look back at the insanity of the week, returning champions are here today. We've got Laura Laham, a very funny comedian, performed all over North America, the Middle East. She's been the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. In fact, Saturday, you could see at the Kennedy Center, the 20th anniversary show of the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. I'll be in it. Mason Zayed and other comedians, ArabComedy.com. Plus, she has a show in New York she'll tell us about later. Laura, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Also back, look who it is, Dustin Chafin, coming to us live from Texas. You've seen him (laughs) on HBO's Crashing, Showtime, a regular on so many shows on Series XM, including this one. He's touring the country all the time, and that's why he's in Texas. Dustin, nice to see you, brother. Nice to see you. Good to be here. And look who's back, Scott Blakeman. He's made countless television appearances. NBC called him one of the top political comics working today. We co-created a show called Stand Up for Peace, which failed because the world's on fire. But in any event, we still did that. And Scott, good to see you just back from Paris where you performed there. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I just always wanted to say that I just got back from Paris. But uh, <laughs> um, and it's basically the comedy scene. There's like New York in the in the 80s. It, sort of was a, it was funny. I did a couple of shows there. They have the nicest venues. Uh, uh, like I performed in a 12th century cave. So, you know, what? Well, it's basically, yeah, they have all these incredible little places. So, uh, do you get paid in like half smoke, half smoke cigarettes and croissants or like, uh, how do you, how do you get, like, I, I would take the you croissants, but I did get to get, did get a few euros. You got a few comedy, euros. Wow. You got paid. <laughs> you got paid. I did get paid for one, one, one of the shows. Yeah. And the other one they requested that I pay them, but I know, have to forward cool. this episode to the IRS to make sure that Scott has reported that foreign yeah. income <laughs> on his tax return. This, the whole, this <laughs> yeah. show brought to you by the IRS. We're coming to your, coming to you soon. Literally. All right. Speaking of somebody getting in trouble though, Donald Trump convicted 34 felonies, not one, not five, 34 felonies. And now the question is, Will it actually mean anything to anybody in America? That's the kicker, because the polls so far have shown not much movement, but it does take time, because some people don't pay attention. Some really think it's political. Others have to understand the importance of it. So, Laura, let's start with you. What do you think? Do you think ultimately for some voters around the edge that Democrats can talk about this and say, hey, do you really want a convicted felon as president? What do you think? I mean, I think maybe it would work for a handful of voters, but I would sooner believe like a chunk of voters would storm the New York City courts from God knows where Alabama than say that they wouldn't vote for Trump. (laughs) Like I like these are the same people who had absolutely no moral issues with this guy uh, being a, a draft dodger or a convicted rapist or like a treasonous Russian agent. Like I just don't think hush money is where they draw the line. Uh, what do you think? I th- well, you you can't ask me questions. It's my show. It's a one way street. I ask you, and you can ask me questions. I'm, kidding. So, I'm just saying. I don't think that's Perhaps where they you don't draw know the whole line. concept of, of being a guest on a radio show. And I'm kidding. This of course, you can ask me questions. Now. I think you're absolutely right, Laura. Laura hijack the show, which is as an Arab, you can't. We can't even use those terms. But the oh my God. look, I think for MAGA, of course, it doesn't move MAGA people. I just wonder other people, like if people were really torn. Who do I go with? Because MAGA, I love MAGA. Dustin, the MAGA people are like, this is going to make Americans love them more. So those people who are torn, like, I'm not sure who to vote for. Oh, that guy convicted of 34 felonies? That's my guy. I don't think it really moves those people. I think it makes the MAGA faithful more excited because now they got a guy with with con- with con convictions. What do you think, Dustin? You're, you're from that area. Well, You've seen the MAGA I also, people. I also think most presidents are criminals to a certain extent. So, And I also feel we glorify criminals in this country. I mean, the most watched shows are like serial killers and, you know, Ponzi schemes and things that, you know, we we seem to embrace that. It's definitely going to make them stronger. I think it's good. And I think it might sway people just because they're so mad at the establishment. It's like it's like being mad at your dad. You're going to go out and just do something that makes everybody else angry. So I think, uh, yeah, I think it's we're in a bad, bad position. Wow. It's going to so make you think stronger. it actually helped. Well, I mean, I, I do look so. forward to the, the Netflix true crime series about Donald Trump because he's got four yeah. trials. It's a whole series. <laughs> It's like oh, encyclopedia. It's, yeah. it's just it's Trump, <laughs> just one word, and it's like you're gonna have you know actors replace him and play him. So Scott, where do you come down on the whole 34 felonies thing? Meaningful? It's definitely meaningful. I think there are some polls that show a little movement, but what's meaningful is like what Dustin says that it it doesn't mean anything to so many people. And you know, normally in politics, like I was in France, where they have a threat from Marine Le Pen, who's very dangerous, but she usually people like that try to appear more normal is what she does. Like, I'm really not that bad. He 
lost an election, even though he denies it, and has gotten much, 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 much worse. And not even just the, the conviction, which is bad in and of itself, and the other ones, which won't happen before the election, which he will be should be convicted of, too, is the things he's saying about jailing political opponents, jailing not just political opponents, but Alvin Bragg, the DA, people like that. Yes, we're going to look into, you know, so he, he's full on dictator mode here. And that to me is, and that doesn't seem to sway people. So uh, what Biden needs to do is to show that a second Donald Trump term would be far more dangerous uh, than the first one, which was bad enough. I want yeah. Trump to say about the people he wants to prosecute. I want him to say, and, you know, Alvin Bragg and Biden and Dean Obidala. Because yeah. that would help my career. You know, if he said, Obidal is going to jail if I get in. Bingo, I'm famous, finally. You know, yeah. like everything happens. You guys are not on the show anymore, of course. It's going to be like a huge <laughs> show. With you. I'm kidding. But it would but be. He's just going to brag about it. He's just going to be like, I got 34. That's the most in, in the history of the world. And nobody's got more than me. He's just going to make it, you know. Uh, as a lawyer, I, as a lawyer, yeah. can I, I just tell you, if you get 35 felonies, you get a free pizza. See, people don't know that. That's one of the little perks in New York law. He'll do it, it for a Big Mac. He'll get 35. It's delivered to your Mac. house. In his case, he'll yeah. transfer a <laughs> cheeseburger. Laura, yesterday, Trump gave a speech in Arizona, and the DNC really did, I'm not joking, put a billboard, one of those digital billboards up outside, which said convicted felon Donald Trump on it. And I'm like, thankfully, Democrats finally saying something, like without this kind of internal debate. What about that? I mean, do you think there's an effective way to talk about the convictions? And for example, let me give you an example here. One Democratic congressman, Eric Swalwell, talked about the 37 countries that Trump can't go to now that he's a convicted felon. And I thought that's kind of interesting. And he was listening to countries like he can't go to France. He can't. Go, there's a whole bunch. And and that makes it more real. Or And he lost his gun license in New York yesterday. They took it away. Like these are the real. So perhaps it's not convicted felons. Like Donald Trump can't go to these countries. Like you just li and then they go, why? Because he's a convicted felon. Without the laughter, <laughs> without the funny part, of it. like yeah. because he's. And do you want a man like that as president? What do you think, Laura? I honestly, I feel like he would be able to turn that into something that is positive for his campaign. Like if you were to tell me that I can't go to France anymore, honestly, personally, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> like great, cool. <laughs> I don't want to. I feel like he would be. What about Canada? Canada's on the list too. again. No. Okay. Is there any same. country you like where you would be upset if you couldn't go to anymore? He would just turn this into a America first. I should stay in America for Americans and then people would eat it up. I'm telling you, I honestly think it would be the best campaign strategy. You guys are all depressing me. This is over. So yeah. it's America's <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> the before more crime he does, the better he is. Wrong. For... All right, well, Dustin, he, what do you think? He, yeah, before he's listening to countries, uh, that guy also uh, did a, uh, you know, Jeff Foxworthy, you know, you're in a cult win, which right. I thought was really funny. <laughs> right. He did. Eric Swalwell did. He did channel Jeff Foxworthy. And only comedians knew that. Like other people were like, what's he? He did a whole, you might be in a cult. And the best yeah. was he's reading the 37 countries and he won't stop. And you can hear them handing the gavel. Order, it's order. Going. Like, Indonesia, going. Malaysia. <laughs> like it was really good. And then he starts going in the rhythm of the gavel. It was he's a the great set. It was a great you know, set. It really did. I have had Eric on the show several times. He has a sense of humor. Like he's not oblivious to what he's doing. He did that on purpose. Yeah. Well, the but only country he wants to go to is Russia, and they would let him in. So uh, anywhere that's strong in Russia, Hungary, any, any any place like that, that's where I'm sure he can go, and that's where he'd be. That's where I, he'd I love think it's interesting. Be. Yesterday at his rally, no sense of irony. He goes, and migrants are bringing crime. I'm like, you're bringing crime. You have 34 <laughs> felony convictions. You're literally bringing crime to the state. You're a one man. You want less crime in America? Vote against yeah. Donald Trump. Maybe Democrats should say that. <laughs> Tired of the high crime rate? He's got three more cases. 88 felonies. He's got 34 down, 50, 54 to go. I mean, it really is. What about yeah. that? Laura, tell me, could Democrats <laughs> at least have fun with this? Like, you know, I mean, he, oh, Trump hates being mocked. And we know that he won't even go to White House correspondence dinner because he does not want to be laughed at. And what about doing something where it's, you know, funny? Oh, Trump says migrants are bringing crime. Trump's bringing crime. Here's the crime he's bringing. Watch out if he comes to your state. Everybody's bringing crime at this point. He's just like, you get a felony. You get a felony. You get a felony. Everybody the gets Oprah. a felony. <laughs> he's the Oprah of crime. So I mean, again, that doesn't, Dustin, what about humor? What about using humor to undermine, because I think the Republicans that hearing with Eric Swalwell don't like being laughed at. Like, look, no one likes being laughed at in a way, but more of us are adjusted and we, I can. Yeah. Well, first of all, 
immigrants bring us delicious food. You know what I mean? Like they're not, <laughs> that's what they bring us <laughs> and they bring us hard work. And so um, I think with his fan base, I've always said this too. I feel we don't talk to his followers the way we should, because we always call them stupid. We always say they're ridiculous, but it's like, we have to find a way to communicate to them that this is not the guy. And instead of going right. after them being dumb, we have to go after, you know, cause I come from this place. I mean, I can't post anything political on Facebook. I'll lose three ants. You know, they'll start trolling me. I'll have to block them. And so it's just, but I understand their mentality, you know, of just coming up and wanting somebody to shake the system. But it's, this isn't the guy, but you have to kind of convince that and then use Jesus against it and be like, you know, it's, how? This is, I love that. Tell, how would you use Jesus against them? That would be, you great. know, it's uh, Jesus was a moral person. He, he was around people that, you know, that people didn't, didn't support and he you know had love and peace in his heart and i think we have to find a way to put love in their heart instead of just anger because it's like you know forgiveness was a huge thing but and it, that's how they that's how they that's how they hold on to him They're like oh we forgive him he has flaws like the rest of us they really identify with that so the christian right the evangelicals white ones they'll forgive you for anything except for like being Muslim or Jewish, apparently like they won't forgive you for that. Like they wouldn't forgive me for being Muslim. Like, no, we forgive a lot of things, but that was a big mistake, especially because your mom's Christian. You could have been Christian, but then again, she's Catholic and the evangelicals don't like the Catholics either. So they don't like either side of my family, the right wing, the evangelicals, you not even kidding. Reverend Jeffers, who's one of Trump's inner circle call Catholicism, a religion from Satan. I mean, and that was recently, we're not talking like yeah. 20 years ago. It was like five years ago. I mean, in the evangelical world, the dislike of the papists and the Catholics is very real. Uh, so they hate a lot of people and I'm glad to be on their list. So yeah, despite uh, their supposed support for Israel and then, you know, pushing for Netanyahu to, to speak uh, for Congress, they don't like oh. Jews. The evangelical, the, the, what they believe is that, that they want Israel in charge so that the rapture could happen. So, you know, right. uh, they could take over. There's no love of Jewish people. They're among the, those evangelicals. And but I think Dustin makes a good point uh, that the, the true religious person would, would be disgusted by Trump. He's the anti Jesus. I mean, Jesus was, you know, embraced the stranger. All true religious people embrace the stranger and goodness and compassion. It's the extremists in religions, the ones who really have nothing to do with that. And those are the ones who seem to embrace Trump. Laura, you, you're you're down with Jesus, right? I mean, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're cool with Jesus. Well, the concept of Jesus like, is great. If Jesus yeah. came back. Would Trump, yeah. would, would, would he like, if he saw Trump, would it be like turning over the tables in the temple? Look what you've done to my father's house. Like, how could you follow? Because I went to Catholic school. I'm well versed in Christianity. Like, I, you know, I was raised both Christian and Muslim. So, like, to me, I think Jesus would be like turning tables over. Like, what's up? This is ridiculous. Throw his sandals at a few people. I mean, that's what I'm <laughs> I mean, if you're going to yeah. think about all of his teachings, then yes, like all the things that um, are in the Bible that uh, Jesus espouses, like all of the, um, like, uh, beauty and heart and like hope that he has in his <laughs> heart for humanity. Uh, I think, I mean, well, like Dustin says, goes against a lot of like what the um, average Trump voter would be. Um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, would it, resonate it like, with. <laughs> right. No, because, it, you know, Scott was mentioning, I mean, the famous passages from Matthew, you were hungry and I fed you, you were thirsty. I gave some drink. You were a stranger. I welcomed you in that kind of stuff. And I guess the Bible they sell at the Fox news gift shop doesn't have Matthew. <laughs> they, they ripped that out. It's, it's also Bible printed upside to... down. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Upside> down. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm talking with Laura Laham, Dustin Chafin, Scott Blakeman. It's what just happened. All right, let's shift gears. Hunter Biden. This is kind of remarkable. First of all, Donald Trump, the Republican nominee, just got convicted of 34 felonies. The president's son, Hunter Biden, is on trial right now in Delaware for crimes. And he's got another criminal trial coming up. I wonder if all the criminality, even though it's not Joe Biden, but if people go like, I guess that's politics now. You get convicted. Your son goes to jail and all that kind of stuff. But I don't the same Republicans who are screaming Donald Trump, it's a witch hunt, it's partisan, have no explanation for why Joe Biden's son is being prosecuted by Joe Biden's Department of Justice. I mean, this is literally the Department of Justice where he run, he's the head of it. I mean, he's the president. It's his DOJ under his agency. And they're prosecuting his son. So, Laura, I mean, is this, is Joe Biden just sacrificing his son? Is this personal? Maybe he doesn't like his son. I think he loves his son very much, so I'm kidding. But 
How come Republicans don't go like, look at the witch hunt after Hunter Biden? They're like, Shh, don't talk about Hunter. It ruins our narrative. Or Bob Menendez, <laughs> right. a senator from New Jersey who's on trial right now in New York, and he's a Democratic senator this DOJ is prosecuting. Don't talk about that either. It ruins the whole witch hunt thing. Yeah. Um, actually, my check from the NRA has not cleared yet, so I can't comment on <laughs> any gun cases. Oh, so that's your At thing. The so the gun ca- right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you no comment. You don't find it hypocritical, though, a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> I'll let you know as soon as that NRA check clears. No. Oh, she's going with the. <laughs> what about you? Let's go to you, Scott. Let's go to the lower box here. What do yeah. you think? The idea that the Republicans, they were like disgraceful, sham trial, worst thing, weaponization. But they're, he's prosecuting Hunter Biden, his own son. Uh Okay, let's, you know, no more questions, that kind of stuff. They have no answer at that point. Well, also, they're so hypocritical because the alleged major crime that that Hunter Biden did was to lie on a form to get a gun saying that he wasn't a drug addict. And he claims at the time that he he wasn't. But meanwhile, these are the people who want everyone to have a gun are are in favor of any gun control at all. And now they're outraged that he, you know, he got a gun. But the thing with Hunter Biden, I do think that the DOJ has reacted the wrong way. I think they felt... Oh, we got to go. I think I think Hunter Biden is a victim in this case because if it was any of us, n- n- nobody would have cared. It wouldn't have risen to right. this level. I mean, and uh, and I think that basically he, yeah. he's had a sad life, and and he, you know, was a crack addict, and he may or may not have lied on an application to get a gun. But facing 25, 30 years, and and this exposure, it's it's really I think so uh, uncalled for, and. It should have been something to be settled. So I think this is a case where he's a victim of the, the Democrats and the DOJ trying to seem like, no, no, we we go after him. So I don't think they should have gone after him in this manner. Certainly Menendez, which they are, he deserves it. But Hunter Biden, I think, is a victim of this uh, pressure. I'm from, from New Republic. Jersey. What Menendez did is what we call Thursday. Getting gold <laughs> bars to get your constituents a halal, halal exclusivity in Egypt to sell halal meat. <laughs> Even though you have no experience in halal meat, why not? Come on, it's Jersey, folks. <laughs> why, do you, why do you pick on him? So, okay, let me. Ask, President Biden said he will not pardon his son. By a show of hands, I know it's not great for radio, but I'll, I'll translate it afterwards here. Even though I'll post the video, if your son, if you were president and your son was convicted of some crime, would you pardon your son? Uh, but show of hands, who would pardon their son? I would pardon my son. Scott, Laura, Dustin, uh, uh-uh. uh. Dustin, let's talk about it. You got some issues. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, the only person I can relate to in all of this is Hunter Biden. Um, okay. I, I understand it. I'm a recovering addict. I know what that means. Uh-huh. Uh, and I know what it means to be angry at your father. And he's not paying enough attention to you. So you act out. And I think uh, it's also I think this is the narrative they should run on. Is sometimes you have to cut off your son or your daughter if they're doing something that's bad. And you got you to have tough love. That's how I would spin this whole thing because really? every parent in america will understand what that is it's like sometimes you have to not give them money anymore sometimes you have to let them spend a night in jail so i think that's that's the angle that i think everybody will understand because a lot of us have you know relatives and sons and daughters and stuff that are just you know addicts and have problems and it also should be i think more discussion on getting people help and i think they should spin it like that you know but that's just my what? opinion what if Biden does as a tough guy? Like, I'm putting my own son in jail. OK, folks, that's how tough I am. You know, don't piss me yeah, off. Tough love. I mean, it's sometimes you have to do that. If there's a guy that people are going to be like, yeah, I get it. It's going to be hard. Biden. <laughs> he's, 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 sympathetic. He's, he's been he's, through it a lot. Laura, would your parents leave you in jail overnight to send a message to you? Like, I don't know your relationship with your parents. <laughs> They go, you know, let Laura, what? She's in jail. Good. Let her stay time overnight. To think about what she deserves done. it. You know, she ran <laughs> away to L.A. Know. for a while. Now yeah, she's back. Yeah. Maybe my little sister uh, to teach her a tough lesson. Um, she's more of like the free spirit. But I think my parents would be like, wait, what did Laura do? She No, she didn't do anything <laughs> wrong. No, absolutely not. My golden child? No way. And they would bail me out immediately. Real. Princess Laura, yeah. like Princess, <laughs> Princess, Laura. Princess Laura Laham. That's very good. Yeah. Scott, your parents, of course, would have bailed you out. They would have. My mother would have been yelling at the cops. She would have went down there screaming <laughs> at the cops. You should go to jail. My mom's Sicilian. She was very <laughs> tough. One. Scott, what do you think? You think your parents would have been like, Scotty, darling, what have you done? Yeah, they, well, I would have. I would have. My mother would have said, you're going to get it when you get home. So they, they would have been. They would have, of course, got Another me jail. out. But yeah. Then it would have oh, been yeah. a little, uh, you know, and get a haircut. 
But other than that, no, they, 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 yeah, they would have done the, the right thing, but I would have had, a, yeah. you know, well, right I'm, to a lesson. I'm the, I'm the only person in my family that hasn't been arrested. So I feel like, really? I, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just from experience and I, I see a brother that's gone out and my mom bails him out. My mom bails him out. And then there this last recently he got arrested again and she didn't bail him out and he actually got his stuff together. Like he's now he's sober and he's, you know, working hard to, you know, it, it did something it to him. It worked. I'm saying, you know, it'll scare you like a uh, scared straight, man. That's, a, you know, that kind of that mentality. That's it, how, you it, know, Dustin doesn't have Arab parents, though, because I would truly be like, keep me in jail. Actually, like <laughs> if my parents came to pick me up, I'd be like, no, 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 I'd like to stay. Actually, I'm good. I'm good. I don't know those people. <laughs> no, the we're not related. They're kidnapping okay. me. That's all right. <laughs> um, wants to stay, that's good. That's there's a new bit for Laura. She'll be doing it Saturday at the Kennedy Center. So yeah. <laughs> let's let's talk about this week in GOP controlling women. So Donald Trump said it's beautiful thing to watch in quotes. That's what he said about states enacting different abortion restrictions on a Fox News interview. And to remind people, there are 14 states where abortion is banned at day one of conception, even in the case of rape. But this is a beautiful thing to watch because this is what Republican I don't know what their vision is of America, but I'm getting the sense more and more if this is a good thing. Laura, and at the same time, this week, Republicans in the Senate blocked legislation that would have enshrined a federal right to access contraception. So, which may, it's kind of inconsistent. Okay, we no abortions and no contraception. You're on your own. Go live your life. So, Laura, where do you come down on this, the idea of these Republicans, generally white men who want to control women, and they don't even care about your health care because abortion is often health care for women. Right. Um, I, I mean, oh my gosh, I don't know. Dean, your, your listeners can't hear how much I roll my eyes. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> your um, just like, yeah, the biggest, I roll. like how many times are we going to have this conversation? How long are we going to have this conversation for? Like, honestly, okay. You're banning abortion. Now you're trying to ban birth control. Like what is next? Is it going to be illegal for women to wear underwear? Like what is the next step? In the, like make it illegal to say no like criminalize consent like what's what oh. is their end goal like just admit that these men can't get a woman to consent normally <laughs> uh and move on that's what i'm saying like any man who's voting for anti-abortion and anti-birth control measures is an incel with no game um or common decency and i stand by that no game i like that very much so yeah. you think their goal is to is it to, to produce more babies? Like their goal is just to have have people have more children. Or I just have to control women? so many opinions on this. It's it's absolutely to control women. It's absolutely mm -hmm. to produce more taxpayers. And I think it's absolutely because uh, our next generations are less and less inclined to join military um, endeavors. And I think that's because uh, there's less the the less poverty there is, the less people join the armed forces. Um, there's yeah a direct correlation. So. I think that there's so many like specific reasons like that, but honestly, I also think these men just don't understand how to get a woman to say yes. So they're going to criminalize saying no. That's where it's going. Scott, what about you? Counterpoint. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's embarrassing. The United States is only one of like three countries that have actually rolled back and gone backwards on for thing. El Salvador, Nicaragua, are the others. And, uh, wow. And uh, first of all, the only silver lining of this despicable attitude the Republicans have, and by the way, th these aren't good moral people. I mean, they're whatever morality is. I mean, they're sleeping or they're doing all kinds of things. So it's all appealing to that real uh, religious base, which, by the way, it does not represent America at all. So on the positive side for Democrats electorally, and it helped in the midterm elections, uh, abortion and and contraception, those are, that, that that's why the Democrats brought it up you know, as a messaging sure. bill, but an important one. And they're so out of sync with what most Americans believe on this. So as far as I'm concerned, let the Republicans keep thinking this until uh, November, because it's going to help the Democrats as despicable as their attitude is. Dustin, you, you, you're around some of these right wing people, obviously, because you bring Texas and stuff like that. Yeah. Is it simply the idea for what can you share? Like, is the idea like, here's my religion and I think it should be law for everyone. Or is there yeah. something else going on that we're missing? Um, well, first of all, I agree with Laura 100 percent. You know, like I've marched with Liz Winstead for oh, Liz, Parenthood. And so, you know, I understand. 
I understand the importance of this right now, but I will say this, and this is when I tap into my, because I have two brains. I have one that went to the new school. I'm a New York City guy. I've traveled the world. I speak other languages. And then th then there's like that other side where I like trucks. And so <laughs> when, I t when I think of that truck side, like I watched that interview and it was terrifying because that's the best he's been in a long time. Like if you're just somebody who's not world traveled, you don't have smart people around you and you watch that interview, you're like, yeah, the states, they should have the say in what happens and we should not make it federal. So I, that interview was, I had to turn it off. At one point he started making sense a few times and I had to be like, okay, I got to stop because it's truck like, that's the power. Like, that's right. the power. That's the cult. That's how he gets you. And I think he actually sounded pretty good in that interview. That's mostly, you know, he's doing insults and trying to be funny or whatever. But it's like that's the terrifying part where he can actually make sense to these people. And then, you know, and I feel like it's, you know, everybody should have a choice. And I believe in women's rights, all that, obviously. But I'm sure. just saying I could see where he could turn people into really. And then they use the religious thing. And Jesus never said anything about abortion. And, and then here's the deal, too. The foster care system, it's just crazy. And none of those people are going in and taking care of those kids that need homes. And that's like we have all these babies that nobody wants to take care of. And that's not the solution. We're just going to have more and more of those babies. And it's the foster care system is going to blow up. And that's not what we need to be doing in this country. So, And I think it's funny. You like the brain. You're part of your brain is I like trucks. We have a lot of truck drivers who listen to Sirius XM. And what's amazing is how many are, are liberal and they call the show, but overwhelmingly they're more conservative. They're more on the right. That's the reality. Yeah. Um, and, and I've learned that firsthand. We're going to do a panel of just truck drivers talking about politics later. We've done this, but in the past, but they're yeah. all liberal. You know, the ones who come on the show on our panel are going to all be progressive. I'm yeah, I just mean F 150s. I'm not talking about driving a semi. Oh, you're talking. Oh, you're not 18 wheelers. These are 18 wheelers. Trucks and Eight, gun F 150? Racks. I'm, just, yeah, I'm not sure know. if they listen yeah. to the show. <laughs> <laughs> listening to the right wing or listen to commercial I'm free music. Fried food, you know, that, that, that brain. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back with Laura Laham, Dustin Chaffin, Scott Blake, and a lot to talk about, including D-Day anniversary. George Clooney calls President Biden and will it have an impact. And what happened to summer blockbusters? Something is really changing here. So we'll take a quick break, come back with more of the Dino B. Dollar Show right after this. Ready? And welcome back. Dino B. Dollar Show. We continue our conversation here on Friday, June 7th, and what just happened? Laura Laham, Dustin Chafin, and Scott Blakeman. So this week, yesterday and today, the commemoration in, in Normandy, France, of the D-Day invasion. And over 400,000 Americans were killed in World War II. 6,000 on D-Day itself in that attack, but over 400,000. And all of America worked together and united. And I really wonder, in this with this current generation, I don't just mean, it's not to pick on younger people. It could be just younger people, even to people in their 30s and stuff like that. Um, and 40s maybe, but would they sacrifice as much? And I'm not saying like, oh, my generation would. I don't think so. I don't. I just don't know, and I don't know. So, Laura, you're the youngest person on this panel. Well, what do you think? Would your generation sacrifice as much as the generations before that fought World War II, or depend on the circumstance? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's um. That's a hard I, <laughs> no. Here's the thing. I read this question and I was just like, what kind of ageist question is this, Dean? Um, I mean, okay, like how many Americans have died in war since World War II? Like, not as just, many. I don't, I, I haven't done the, re I pride myself in never doing research. Um, I, <laughs> well, Vietnam was don't around 55,000. And that the right was the show. biggest one. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, it's less. No, I don't, no, my generation, uh, unless they were forced to, I, I don't see them of, of sacrificing like that. Um, I just think like, okay, well, since then, like we had Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, and like, I feel like we've sacrificed like equivalent, if not more. And then for what, like, if you have to think about it, like for what is this generation sacrificing anything for, like we're sacrificing our fellow like Americans lives for sky high inflation, for no chance at home ownership, for no chance at building wealth, for no health care, for um, like economic crisis after economic crisis. Like what are we sacrificing for, Dean? Um, I feel like if you are trying to convince me to fight for this nation, then we have to have a lot of these issues addressed that I have like pride in fighting for this nation. And I think hmm. that's probably, that's one of the, that's the problem with like the older generation is that like, I don't know. They look at the Great War as this like shining beacon of American might, but then completely devalue every conflict since then. Um, and 
I don't know, like they'll yell at our generation for whatever we like don't do. And it's like, well, okay, calm. first of all, you're the generation that thought hitchhiking was a great, great idea. Okay, calm down. Second of all, you're also the generation constantly like falling for in, like internet scams. Like, I just feel like there's other things we need to address first before you come at us for not wanting to fight for our I'm country. Not, I'm know? not saying, I'm wondering like just in general, but I hear what you're saying. And what about if there was a war on TikTok? You think your generation would fight that? Like the <laughs> TikTok wars? Like there is, there the best there videos, is a war on and whoever TikTok. Makes the best videos, they, they win the war. Like that's the only, no one dies, just a lot of TikTok and you get more followers, you lose followers. <laughs> the only the thing is on TikTok, you would actually hear a lot more truth that would come out from uh, like what actually is happening around the world than uh, what you'd get from American media. Uh, fair enough. And that's why they're trying to ban it because too exactly. much unfiltered truth going on. So, Dustin, what do you think? And this isn't to pick on the generation now that's really the draft age, let's say. It's since World War II. You know, you had Vietnam, and I think Laura makes a great point. I mean, th- we had never had that much loss of life again. Vietnam is around 55,000. Uh, Iraq, Afghanistan to about three or 4,000 soldiers lost. But I, I wonder if it's, a, <laughs> if it's a lack of investment in the country or if it, we were attacked and it was a world war and we all got like, okay, this is it. Aliens have come. Or yeah, whoever. I mean, like, we've got to do this, folks. We're going to die if you don't. Your family's going to yeah, die if you don't. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, I mean, to tap into my F-150 brain, I mean, I would fight for this country in this country because I grew up on Red Dawn. And <laughs> the original, they're, they're not the, repl- the, the original, the original with Patrick original. Swayze. With, with Charlie Patrick Sheen? Swayze, where you get the yeah. truck, you put some supplies in the back and a gun rack and you're ready to fight the Russian army. But uh, yeah, I think um, I also think as a Gen Xer, I feel like all we heard about was how horrible Vietnam was and how, you know, it was a war we shouldn't have been involved in. And then after that, with everything else with the Middle East stuff that we did, I feel like, you know, we're a little jaded on is it the right thing to do? You know, so I think it would take a lot of information being is it is it going to benefit is it hurting other people for no reason and especially in where we are now in the world i think people are just very kind of over this you know first instinct to attack mentality so i don't know i think it would take a lot mm, for both generations yeah scott you're an older millennial so yeah. what would you say about this thing where would you, what what do you, what do you think i mean you grew up a, a, a time i imagine you do you have friends that served at all? I mean, I had some friends who went, well, I, they volunteered, they went to Iraq and stuff. And like I was that. old enough with, you know, uh, in high school, I mean, you know, they still had numbers and I had a high draft number. I never had to serve. I was going to join the Merchant Marine. That was my plan. Were but, you really? Well, it never got to that, thankfully. But I have to say, I mean, I, I learned more about D-Day by reading about it. First of all, you know, uh, I just, when I think of war in the military, it always just makes me sad. I just think it's always a huge mistake. Of course, we're indebted to those, to the people who lost their lives. Uh, but also you have to think of the, just the victims, the people who died at 20. I mean, and it was it was more than just Americans, too. I mean, there, there were just sure. as many British soldiers killed and Canadian and French resistance. And what I just learned yesterday was that 20, more than 20,000, the day of D-Day, 400 French civilians were killed by Allied bombing. So I always grew up that it's sort of like, oh, they're all bad, we're great. And Dean, you're right that 55, no, 55,000 died of Vietnam. That's the most. But think of the hundreds of thousands Americans have killed Iraqis, Afghanis, and our sure. bombs killing Palestinians as we speak. So, you know what? The greatest, gen- and, and I take issue with the greatest generation. I, I'm thankful. I'm indebted Who to Who came up with that? Were they that. really the greatest? Is there a- No, I, first of all, and I do believe Amen. that they were faced with this thing. And, I, and if this generation was faced with it, I think they react the same way. But to me, you know what the greatest generation will be? And what? going along with, you know, the Laura said, is the generation that says, no, war is stupid. It's impossible. We're not going to go have war anymore. And I wish that we got you know, science, medicine, we've we've progressed. But when it comes to it, and I think war has become cool now. You know, you have war influencers on Instagram, you know, and it, it's to me, it's sickening and it's stupid. And every war shouldn't have happened. We needed to do what we did in World War II, but there were mistakes along the way that led to that. So the greatest generation will be the one that figures out that all war is bad. People dying is bad, and we need to just stop ever getting to that point. I think, Laura, what if we had a vote on TikTok, who's the greatest generation? Do you think that generation would win? Or you think younger generations? I hope my generation makes a top five. That's all I'd like to be. Like, I'm not... (laughs) 
Gen X doesn't have to be the top, but like top, like me and it's, Eddie it's Vedder. It's top three. It's top right, three. Maybe top four. It's like Eddie yeah. Vedder. I gotta be and, honest. It's yeah. gonna Stars. be the generation that knows how to use TikTok, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, exactly. it's not gonna be the generation that does not know how to flip a PDF. So <laughs> it's gonna be Gen Z versus so millennials. So we're borderline. We're Bring borderline. it up. Yeah. By the way, Laura, is there any attention on millennials? Because millennials usually get all the attention in the world. And then the next generation came, and I would tell millennials, look, you're getting all this love. I was there, Gen X. What are we what are they thinking? All those, all those same articles. Then it was millennials. Now, millennials, you're dead. Now we're the younger people. What, what do they want? So have, do you have any attention with millennials? Do you go like and do they go like these young kids don't know anything? Like, do you hear that kind of stuff? Uh, sometimes, but I also feel like millennials really normalize mental health as a um, something to work on as a generation. And so uh, we take a look at those articles, we take a look at that tension and we go, why? <laughs> like, what? It's not good for us. It's not good for you. Like, just take a nap, babe. <laughs> so, it, all right, so, so eat something, just eat something. Yeah, yeah <laughs> eat something game. green. <laughs> I always remember, see, Colin Quinn, who is I don't know if it was the old age now, probably late 60s, maybe 70. Um, had a funny joke about his generation about the idea of like, if you were something happened, like, oh, you know, I was young and this happens. Like, well, you're big now, so get over it. That kind of stuff. That was the idea of mental health. Yeah. And he kind of just, <laughs> yeah. like, you're big, get over it. Come on. You know, and, and it's very funny. I, I always think of that joke because it was really insightful. And I remember seeing him do it 20 something years ago. And, and People are got because he's like the younger people are so sensitive, and that way here's what they told my generation: you're big, get over it, and so you walk it off. I'm chatting with Laura Laham, Dustin Chafin, and Scott Blakeman. So Scott, you mentioned the Middle East there and, and Palestinians. So President Biden, Republicans, and a handful of Democrats are very critical of the International Criminal Court because they want to hold Benjamin Netanyahu responsible for, accountable for, wait for it, war crimes, because he committed them. And but there's like, no, you can't do it. Well, Amel Clooney, George Clooney's wife, is a lawyer and has worked with the ICJ on developing the cases where they are going to have arrest warrants for Netanyahu and Hamas leaders. And so Clooney called one of Biden's top aides last month to complain about the president's criticism of the ICJ. So a lot of it, we can't move Biden too much on these issue. On this issue, he's moved a little bit. But I wonder if celebrity and George Clooney's actually raising money for him. I, I wonder if that can have an impact. What do you think? Well, well, Clooney's supposed to speak, be at a fundraiser, and, and yeah. next week for Biden, and he has some leverage there because his wife. What what beyond just criticizing, which by the way, yes, Netanyahu and Israel have committed war crimes, Hamas committed war crimes, all of them should be held to account. Uh, but what they also want to do is sanction. The, she's a human rights lawyer. That's one of the loftiest, most noble professors you could have. And uh, they want to put sanctions on her, which would obviously affect, you know, uh, the family. You know, instead of attacking the, these organizations, let's stop the, the war crimes and the genocide and the killing of innocent civilians. And also the United States still hasn't resumed its funding for UNRWA, which is the only uh, humanitarian relief organization for Palestinians. They did an exhaustive investigation there were like 12 people who maybe had some Hamas connections. They were fired. And meanwhile, I mean, it's a humanitarian crisis to begin with. And, and the U.S. and other countries haven't resumed their funding. Instead, we bomb uh, UNRWA, uh, Israel bombs UNRWA schools, uh, which I'd love, by the way, getting into that quickly. They say we use precise surveillance. And yet, how do they explain that 35, 40 civilians are killed? You know, so well, they knew they were there. Uh, so that's they, a war they crime. Knew they were again, there. Let's not uh, in and of itself. So, um you know, it's just and if you really want to get sick and just watch like Matt Miller, these spokespeople try to dance around it. You know, I mean, there's some great reporters asking Ned price and but, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, know, well, like, we, we we urge Israel to really try not to kill too many civilians. We, we're, we're urging them. And we're urging Palestinians get out of the way of the bullets. Why do you get in front of the Israeli bullets? It is all your fault. So, Laura, what about you? I mean, you've we've talked before about the Middle East and you've posted stuff many times about this horrific conflict in Gaza. Do you think that George Clooney calling will make Republicans and Democrats agree to do a carve out for Amel Clooney? So while they might sanction ICJ, but like we can't do it to a celebrity. <laughs> That's just not can't do that. No, I don't think it's going to make a difference, honestly. And I think uh, Biden very much knows like there's very clear like direct routes where if um, the ICC functions as it's supposed to function, that Biden is next, right? That they would have every right to sanction him directly or to to um, 
you know, bringing up a case against him directly uh, for the war crimes he's aided and abetted. Um, so I think I don't I I think they're going to try and sidestep this whole thing. It's interesting to see what happens. And of course, as of now, we don't know if it'll happen. July 24th, Netanyahu is invited to Congress because it's good to have a war criminal give a speech from our own chamber. Why not? And he maybe can take some weapons home while he's there. Like, hey, you got a doggy bag. We had a great gift bag for you. Look under your chair, Benjamin Netanyahu. There's more precision guided missiles there. Wink, they're not really precision. Just So, Dustin, where do you come down with your truck brain on this one here? <laughs> well, I have deep, deep compassion for the horrible things that are happening. But I also think that uh, sometimes you got to stay out of your woman's business. You know what I mean? She's a big girl. <laughs> and I feel like he's meddling a little bit in that. And it's like, my girl's a con- Comic and like if somebody's rude to her at a comedy club, I don't call the comedy club and be like, hey, you guys should really, you know, book her more or whatever. Like, it's just something about meddling and, and he's using his celebrity. And I get it. You're, you're passionate about what your partner is involved in. But I don't know. I think it's uh, he's using a little bit of. Uh, That's interesting. Know, it does amount to very human dynamics. The idea of like the part like uh, why, you know, you don't have to call for your wife. Let your, She's a lawyer. She can call. Why are you taking your agency away? Yeah, she's Next way smarter she than She can't you. have birth yeah. control. <laughs> and she can't have a, an abortion when she wants it. That's how it happens. You first like, you're helping a woman. Then, you know, you're controlling them. Like, no, 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 honey. Let me call. I'll take care of this kind of stuff. Laura, how do you come down on that? I didn't see the relationship dynamic involved. Would you be happy if someone in a relationship with made a call to help you or like, no, no, I'll take care of this. I mean, it is like, it is giving the same energy as like, it doesn't matter unless it affects me directly. You know how there's a lot of people who uh, flip on abortion or uh, LGBTQ uh, laws. Like once they find out somebody in their own family or somebody that, like very close to them uh, is affected by something like this. Um, and so uh, he's still campaigning for Biden, like George Clooney's still campaigning for Biden, but it's mm-hmm. like, you're doing this because it affects your what? Like it affects somebody you're directly related to. Like, would it, like, would you be doing this in any other case? You know what I mean? It's kind of, it's kind of icky. Yes. That's a good point. You're right. Because if it was, if, if he wasn't married to Mel Clooney, he's not calling the White House to go no. lay off the ICJ. That's not fair. Exactly. Let them do their job. No, he's hooking up with yeah. Brad Pitt at the, you know, ladies night. That's what he's doing. Him yeah. and- <laughs> <laughs> That's remarkable. So talking about relationships here and I'm not getting to the gossipy part because I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. I, I, all I know is years ago, Ben Affleck and JLo did videos, the music videos and they were the, the couple JLo and what was it when they were together? Well, there was a term for it. It's still out there. I can't remember right now, uh, but Ben, no, Jen, what's the Benifer? word they use to combine Benifer. as a couple? Benefer, that's the word. So yeah. the years ago. So then they broke up. Then they get back together now, years later, and you say, okay, they're really mature. They have kids. They've gone through all the relationships. Everything's fine. But it, apparently they got married in 2022 and it's falling apart. But the reason we know more is that they just put on the market their house, which is $60.85 million. $60 million house. It's got a gym. It probably has someone who's stuck there who has to work there all the time. I'm not even kidding. It's got pickleball courts. It's got everything and more. And I'm like, the relationship might not be going good, but to keep the house, maybe you stick it out. <laughs> Look, I mean, sometimes you compromise in a relationship. You're like, well, yeah. I'm not really getting along too well, but we do have this rent control apartment and yeah. don't want to lose that. Yeah. This is $60 million house. Suck it up. It's 43000 <laughs> Yeah. 43,000 square feet. But I, Us Weekly says they're on two completely different pages. Yeah, in the same house, it's massive. You could be in your own wing and be on a different page. Why exactly. can't you stay together? But Laura, let's start with you. I mean, is there, <laughs> have you ever compromised a relationship for, you know, like things aren't going great, but this one thing in the relationship that's tangible is really good. So we're going to stick with it or it's like so we're on different pages. Let's put the house up for $60 million on sale. Oh my God. People have settled for far less than a $60 million house. Get it together. You guys, like you said, like, okay, you're not, you're not vibing. There are a thousand bedrooms. Pick a new one. <laughs> Go every to night. the other side. Yeah. Every night, just pick a new one on the other wing of the house. Like there's even the guest house is itself a mansion. You know what I mean? Like you make it work. I mean, come on. <laughs> Come on. Scott, you've been in relationships. You're in yes. one now. What do you think? I mean, where where do you draw the line? Two bedroom, three bedroom apartment? Like, look, I'm honestly, not I, about if I broke up with someone, I would stay in the same studio with her just to save money because, but I mean, 30 bedrooms. Now, I do like the 10, that was 17 bathrooms. Now, my, I mean, to me, 
two bedrooms, two bath would be like the the ultimate thing. I, I but as you said, they could be in a they, they're another time zone that mansion. So and also getting back to you know they went out years ago, they got back together. The odds of those kind of relations working out are about the same as the team coming back from a three zero deficit in the Stanley Cup to win. You know those never work out anyway. Uh, no, you know so I they would because they matured. They have kids like they no. they. I thought they would and they knew the pressure. They knew everyone would watch it. Z Dustin. I mean, what, what would you would you compromise for Absolutely. 17 bathrooms? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, being someone who struggled as a comedian for many years, it's like I pride myself on never having to sign a lease with every relationship I was in. You know what I mean? Like it's like I'm not I'm not chicken. I mean, these two obviously don't need each other financially. Right. But True. uh but they he doesn't look happy. He's been been, you know, he's there's all these like paparazzi photos, he's just depressed with like dunking donuts in his hand. Like he's just not <laughs> it's, at the at one point it's like you could yeah. Get a get a five bedroom and be happy. So I get it. Just they don't need to be together. I think they need to just like because they're not happy. You see the, the video it's, footage. It's weird. I wonder how you're right. And the weird quirk is that Ben Affleck, when he left Jennifer Gardner, and I don't know if they were formally divorced or separated, he started dating a woman I know. But the problem was she was married to my friend. And so mm -hmm. he she cheated on her husband with Ben Affleck. Oh, and she wow. Saturday Night Live. And I want to say her name, but it, it's in all the press and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of and then I bumped into her once and I want to go like, say, hey, how was the thing with Ben Affleck? But I didn't but I know her husband. He's a comic. <laughs> he was a comedian. He works at a yeah. late night comedy show as a producer. But it was a weird thing to, to know someone in the picture. I'm like, I know her. Like I used to live with her for years and I know her husband and they, they just put it like, and she was still married at the time and they have a child. I'm like that's my friend. She screwed over, but she's dating Ben Affleck. So you're like, well, I'm kind of happy for her dating Ben Affleck, but I really feel bad for my friend. And it's completely true. And it's a weird thing to see her about like a year ago. I bumped her or in the neighborhood, like walking around here. All right. We have only like a minute or two left. I wanted you guys to give a chance to plug the things you're going to work on. Because Laura Laham, it's not just Saturday night, the Kennedy Center. You have a lot more going on. So where can people follow you and what's coming up with you? Oh, my gosh. Yes, please uh, follow me on Instagram at Laura Laham. Uh, we've got the Kennedy Center coming up this Saturday. I'm so excited for it. The Arab American Comedy Fest. It's going to be incredible. On Tuesday, I have a show at Caveat called Deadly Sin Comedy, where we explore all seven deadly sins and the eighth deadliest, which is stand-up comedy. Um, and then I'll be around New York City for uh, the rest of the summer. I'll be in Atlanta at some point. I'm just going to be traveling around doing shows. So it'll be all over my Instagram at Laura Lahab. And Dustin, you're literally on the road right now. Where can people follow you? Yeah, you uh, this weekend I'll be in Corpus Christi at the State Street Comedy Club. Uh, four shows. Come check it out. And then next State weekend, uh, did you say State Street? Uh, Mesquite, Comedy? Mesquite Street. Oh, Mesquite Street. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mesquite, Mesquite Street I'm Comedy sorry. Club. Yeah, here in Corpus Christi. And uh, next weekend I'll be in Bozeman, Montana at the Last Best Comedy Club. So yeah, come check wow. me on the road. Yeah, it'll be fun. That's the road, folks. Please check out Dustin Chafin. He is on the road. It's a hard. He works hard. Always <laughs> a lot touring. of airports, a lot of super right. eights. Yeah. Scott's just sort of like chilling at this point. Scott, what about you? Where can people fall between well, Paris? By and the way, New York I'm so City? proud to be on the show with Dustin because he took my stand-up workshop. I the did. I, wow. and I used to always say Scott. he took your class. I'd always say John Stewart, of course, but <laughs> Dustin is always in there, and I'm so. Amazing, not amazing. Thank you, buddy. Doing so great, and it had nothing Thank to do with you, me, but I'm just you happy too. For you, you, oh, are you kidding me? You got me out of my shyness. You got me to talk really? about stuff. It was great. Yeah, Scott's great. So Scott's an Scott, incredible coach. Scott taught comedy, and he has taught John Stewart when John was new yeah. comic, and, and Caroline Ray, Ray, and I still do, uh, you know. Uh, stand up classes and I also uh got my podcast getting through this with Tom and Scott with Tom Saunders and you could hear my political commentary on Center Clip an uh, audio uh, political commentary platform. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. We were all great. I am glad we got through almost all the topics today. I wish you all a 43,000 square foot home with 17 bathrooms <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> in the court. That's what we I can want. do the show from there. <laughs> Folks, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back with more of the Dino Bidala show right after this.